Welcome back to Recap. Johnny D on visuals, QQ on loudmouth duty. As is traditional, I'll open with games journalism. Are you ready for more of this person? I'm not. Oh god, please, make her go away. But I have to talk about her again due to another finding that Boogie Pop Robin made. This time, the roles are reversed. By now, we're used to Ellison being inappropriately close to her subjects. But this time, another reporter was found to be inappropriately close to Ellison when writing about her as a subject. Oh, bravo, Ellison! Breaking new ground in games journalism by lacking professional distance in both directions. But we really can't blame her this time. This time, the blame goes to another freelancer, Chris Selenthrop. The New York Times hires him as a video games critic. And here he is, writing about interactive fiction and twine games for the New York Times. And complimenting one of Kara Ellison's games. And wait, donating to her Patreon? And then broadcasting this fact to everyone on Twitter? Sorry, Chris, you got caught. Well, really, you practically outed yourself. Now the ball's in your court, and it's up to you to make amends. Onwards to Dale North and Nick Chester. This was through original research by Boogie Pop Robin with a helping hand from Anons on V and Industry Lol on Reddit. Remember back to that joke on the Game Journal Pros list about how sleeping with a PR agent was a normal thing? Well, this is a different type of sleeping together. But we do know that Nick Chester, former Destructoid editor-in-chief and PR for Harmonix, has slept in the same bed as his good friend, Dale North. Dale North took over editor-in-chief duties at Destructoid when Nick Chester left. And according to Chester's Twitter history, they maintained a friendly relationship with each other. There were even confessions of their friendship in two articles, one by Nick and one by Dale. So being good friends with a PR agent from a game company, you might want to recuse yourself or offer disclosure when writing about that company. Not, I don't know, write almost 30 articles about harmonics without doing either of these things. Now, this isn't quite as cut and dry as most conflicts of interest. I mean, he was friends with a PR guy who worked at a company that he was writing about. But still, this is the kind of stuff that we need to be on the lookout for and we need to raise awareness of. As a footnote, Dale North is no longer editor-in-chief of Destructoid. Here's all the headlines that don't fit anywhere else. Kate Edwards, head of the IGDA, was interviewed in a GamesIndustry.biz article about how Gamergate shows the need for change in the industry. I agree, we've demonstrated that big reforms need to happen. However, the changes that she thinks need to happen don't match mine. The article was filled with the usual bogus threat narrative drivel. My interpretive summary is, All game companies are guilty of the original sin of misogyny and should pay money to experts on diversity, like me and my friends, who offer ineffective but feel-good sounding solutions to problems that we invented. In the interview, she mentions about how she tried to start a dialogue with Gamergate, but it became clear that, quote, in any attempt I made, that there's no interest in dialogue at all. It's not about that for Gamergate. Oh yes, I remember Kate's attempts at dialogue. Like when she signed up for a block list to try to block all of Gamergate, the block list that she promoted. Stay classy, Kate. On to the Honey Badgers, who I paid 25 bucks to to help them make an appearance at the Calgary Expo. They're starting a legal fund to take action against the Expo in response to the Honey Badgers' bizarre eviction and banning. On to another tidbit. Game developer American McGee, who was not affiliated with Gamergate, expressed his interest in hearing conservative journalist Milo Yiannopoulos and feminist cultural critic Anita Sarkeesian debate each other. For this crime, he was accused of supporting Gamergate and received death threats on Facebook. But those opposed to Gamergate never engage in guilt by association and are always paragons of virtue due to their enlightened perspective on intersectionality, right? Next tidbit. In honor of the Society of Professional Journalists Ethics Week, TechRaptor updated their ethics policy. Give it a read. From what I saw, it looks to be the most thorough ethics policy in the whole of the games journalism industry at this point in time. So bravo TechRaptor, consider giving them some traffic. Remember, it's not enough to just tear down the establishment, we have to rebuild as well. Finally, there was a Gamergate meetup in a bar in Washington, D.C. There were a lot of familiar faces there. Conservative journalist Milo Yiannopoulos and freedom feminist Christina Hoff Summers were there, as were between 200 and 300 other people. You might recognize a lot of the people in these pictures. I've seen the pictures, videos, and tweets about the event, and it looks like everyone had a great time. Sadly, this wasn't without attempts to ruin things by those opposed to discussing Gamergate. Arthur Chu made an absolute fool of himself trying to rally his followers to shut down the event, and he sent deeply embarrassing emails to the bar to try to get 
get them to deny Gamergate a venue. The bar owners were having none of that, refusing to kick any group out because this is America. However, the rabble-rousing continued, with Chu becoming increasingly hysterical and finally declaring that it ends tonight. Meanwhile, bomb threats were issued against the bar. A Twitter threat is confirmed, and it is rumored that there are phoned-in threats as well. Now, this is a bomb threat against Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. We don't know who made these threats, but I can guarantee that they aren't just criminal assholes, they're also humongous imbeciles. Anyway, the bar was evacuated shortly after midnight. The rumors at first were that it was due to a fire drill, but waiting outside wasn't a fire truck, but a bunch of police cars and a bomb squad. I have no proof, but my assumption is that the police said it was a drill for a more orderly and less panicked evacuation. So, can we now claim that over 200 participants in the Gamergate revolt were swatted? Anyway, this is a developing story, and I'll report more on it next week if any details change. Also, the media response has already been fascinating, but it falls off the end of the timeline and will have to be covered next episode. Ooh, a cliffhanger. Be sure to keep your eyes on this space for more. And that's all I have time for this week. Join me and Johnny D again next time for more. Ciao!